Okay, good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to make this presentation this morning about uh, an exotic animal for most of you. Uh, how many are working with fish? One, two, three. Okay. Um, I think I talked about fish the first, uh, in the fir our first meeting uh, workshop, uh, and now I finish also up with uh, some fish. Um, okay, uh, my title is Plant Feed Ingredients in Fish. Diets may compromise gut function and fish health. And I, I will, yeah, here's a scoop of fish, uh, fish feed. Um, the um, um, content of my presentation will first be perspectives of aquaculture in Europe, food production. I will compare with some other meat productions in Europe. Um, I will t just touch briefly upon some technological aspects of uh, aquaculture, because this is huge and I will uh, compare it to the cow barns, the technology we have. Um, I will also talk about the great changes that we see in fish feed ingredients and uh, composition, and mention briefly the anti-nutrients in the fish diet. Uh, of course, the, the plants contain anti-nutrients, which are very uh, foreign to, the, to, to these fish, at least the salmon and then go to the health aspects. Just mentioning briefly some problems we have. Uh, I hope you don't walk out here after getting with the impression that all salmon are sick, but as this is in focus of my presentation, I have to tell you about. And I'm sure you can appreciate, uh, with those of you working in, uh, with other animals, that uh, in the past we probably had a lot of these same problems in chicken uh, industry and uh, pig industry, but we, have, we tend to forget about it. But now the fish industry is in the same position. Uh, and aquaculture is not new at all. It's like go ages, thousands of years back in, in China. Uh, but the, what is new is the, are the dimensions, the feed sources, the technology. And we are, we are in the middle of a process where we, we still undergo great changes. Um, if you look at the European meat uh, production, you see here that this is the pig meat production, 25 million tons. Cattle meat is a little lower and decreasing a little bit in Europe, including Norway, uh, whereas the chicken is increasing. So we replace the, the cattle meat with, with chicken. If we go to the smaller productions, turkey meat is 1.5 million tons a year, rabbit down here, and then the, the horse is here. I wonder whether these numbers are correct. <laughs> it's very low, <laughs> can't be a big problem, but if it's higher, I, yeah, okay. Um, and the game meat, goat meat, I mean, and game meat are in the same, very low. What about aquaculture? And this is the total in Europe, it's the fastest growing product, meat production in, in Europe and the world as a whole also. And we have just gone through the prognosis for the next uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, in, and this is what Norway expects to, how it expects to increase in salmon production, reaching 5 million tons around 2050. Um, and what are we producing? Well, we are producing uh, some sea bass and sea bream at this level, not increasing that much. We are producing some trout, and the increase is not uh, convincing either. But the salmon is like this from 1990 until today. So it's a, it's a very, very steep increase. Um, it has been a great success to Norway, uh, and I think also to Scotland and Faroe Islands and Iceland, but at a lower scale. It's now the third largest export industry in Norway, which is huge for us. We are not that many people. Uh, and, but of course, you can imagine it's not without challenges. And this is the barn, this is the, the salmon uh, house, which is uh, laying there on the surface, it's not, uh, but you can't see any animals. That's what part of the problem, the problems. Uh, here is a, 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 a drawing of uh, what it looks like, which um, makes you um, get a better picture. And look at these two guys standing there. This is a big, big house, fish house. Um, it has, uh, it's not uncommon that it's a 50 meter across uh, in diameter and 20, 30 meters. And with, if we are going to reach 5 million tons in uh, 2050, I'm, we need larger cages as well. 
Um, the volume is about 40,000 uh, to 60,000 uh, cubic meters. Um, and the maximum density we can use is 25 kilos per, per cubic meter. I think that's comparable to the, 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 the chicken or the uh, broiler production, the space a broiler, product, broiler has in when, when the, they are grown out. Five fish per cubic meter at slaughter. That's, uh, that means, uh, and we have restrictions on number. Uh, for the time being, the, the maximum an number of animals you can have in this is 200,000. Uh, it may increase when the, these nets, uh, pens are increasing, but that means uh, the biomass at slaughter will be up to 1,000 tons. And how many cows is that? 1,800 cows, biomass, which is, it's a huge <laughs> uh, house for animals and many animals. And most, um, yeah, when we want to feed this fish, you need five, when you're approaching slaughter, five tons a day. And um, most farmers have more than one pen, like this is, here is five. So there will be one million fish in there and uh, a big issue to get feed to all these animals. How do we feed them? And, and we can't see them. And there are all kinds of equipment, I won't tell you about this, how to monitor how many fish, how many die, how many eat, to make sure that the fish is spread to the, all the fish. Um, and uh, this is a feeding uh, the uh, container or the equipment for holding the feed. And uh, the feed is many different technologies, but piped, blown with, by air, into the net pen to, to the fish. Um, and they have mon big uh, frames where the fish can swim through and they measure the length and the height and can estimate uh, the biomass. Uh, but uh, just to give a little glimpse into the business, it's, it's um, great. <laughs> so what are the nutrient sources? Well, they used to be fish meal and fish oil, but the last 25 years, uh, catches uh, are, are stable or going down and the demand is going up and prices go up. So uh, the, last, uh, the increase in production in the last 15 years has relied on alternative uh, feed ingredients. So all, um, the, in 1990, um, about 70% of the diet were from marine resources. Uh, today, we're down to 30 and in in 2050, uh, it will be below 10 because there will be not, no more fish meal out there. So we have to use alternatives. Um, and I don't think any animal production has seen anything like this. Um, and what are the alternative feed ingredients from plants? We have soybean, peas and beans, sunflower, rapeseed, wheat and corn gluten. Thanks to the fuel production from, uh, from grains. We get uh, protein-rich uh, byproducts that we can use for fish, like the glutens and several others. We have new alternative uh, resources. We have some marine, of course. The krill, which we can harvest in the, down in the Antarctica, can be used, but it, it, they are not cheap to get hold of. And uh, the catches are variable. They don't really know where the swarms are. Um, and, I, and also human consumption will compete for these uh, resources. Insects, we talked about that yesterday. I think this is a very uh, potentially great source of protein as well as uh, lipid for, for the fish. Um, single cell proteins as well. We haven't talked about that, but uh, we have produced bacteria from, from gas. Uh, and, uh, and yeasts are also promising, produced from, from uh, sawdust or from, uh, from uh, wood. And there's a lot of wood that can't be used for much else, so we, which we can use, but we need the fertilizer, we need the phosphorus, we need the nitrogen, etc. But we are working in Norway now quite a bit to, to get hold of alternative protein sources. And the, both the uh, Metallococcus and the, and the yeast, several yeast species are very promising. Um, improved n knowledge on nutrient requirements, because the, the bad thing about this also is that 
it's such a new animal production, we don't know the requirements, the nutrient requirements, and how can you produce a balanced diet without knowing the, the requirements? Um, we, we work on it and we get new knowledge all the time, but still we don't really know. And this is uh, what has happened to the protein level of the diets. And we started out with fish meal and fish oil and with a very high protein level. And also due to technological challenges, we could not, because what should you replace protein with? The fish does not need car carbohydrate really, a little bit, but not much, and they can produce it from protein if uh, available. Um, but the problem was that we, we were not able to put as much lipid into the diet as, as we had to if we were to reduce the protein level down to what we calculated was the requirement. So, but we have now got technological uh, processes that can increase fat. So in fat in has increased a lot, whereas carbohydrates used to be about 20%, but is now down some. Because these animals are so efficient, they don't need energy for maintenance, hardly. Of course, they need some, but it's v the requirement is very, very low. So we, we, we don't really need to think about it. And what we use for chickens and pigs uh, for energy, for maintenance, is mostly carbohydrates. And if they don't need that, we take that out, and the protein level and lipid level goes up. But then we need the very concentrated ingredients. And what has happened to the, to the uh, protein uh, level related to energy? A great decrease. Um, yeah, production technology is market, uh, market changed. Also uh, regarding feed, from we used to, started out with wet feed or just throwing frozen uh, capelin into the nets and hoping the fish would eat. That was the start. Uh, and they got um, vitamin A and vitamin D deficiencies, etc. But uh, now we have, are more sophisticated. And we have continued from pelleting to extrusion. Extrusion is necessary to get the fat into the diet and we use vacuum coating. We add some fat into the mash and, and make the pellets and make them expand to so be able to soak up uh, lipid. So this is the inside a uh, well, vacuum coater. Okay, yeah, here's another equipment for feed uh, f uh, distribution. Yeah, all these changes have happened very quickly over a few years and you can imagine science is not moving that fast. And a lot of these new techniques, new uh, feed compositions have been tested out on the country scale. And um, still, uh, Norwegians uh, working in this industry are, used to be fishermen, they just go out and catch harvest and, well, are not planning so much ahead. And, I mean, this is uh, something we see also in the aquaculture business. They are quite courageous in trying new, new ingredients. Um, most of these ingredients are already acknowledged as feed components for, for land animals and they have used the same regulations. Um, yeah. When we use these uh, new ingredients, we get also anti-nutrients. And just briefly remind you of what are the anti-nutrients. We have enzyme inhibitors, lectins, saponins, sterols, estrogens, glucosinolates, uh, quinolicidines like lupamine, a uh, lot of phytate, oligosaccharides, tannins, <coughs> and not at least fiber. <coughs> I could give you a, an hour's uh, lecture on each. I won't do that now. And there may be some unknowns that fish are, are reacting to, that chickens are not, for example. So we are constantly watching out for maybe new compounds. <coughs> These anti-nutrients, we have to study their effects in the fish, and we need them then isolated. And that's a very great difficulty. They are so expensive if they are available at all. But during the last 10 years, we in our center of excellence have had this in focus, what are the anti-nutrients doing to the, to the salmon? At least what we know is that they increase the chance of, of introducing uh, uh, nutrient imbalances and deficiencies. <clears throat> I will give you now, as I said, some examples. And uh, keep in mind that I'm now focusing on the, on the problems. But this is a, it's a success story, but we have to watch out. Um, none of them are what I report now are frequently reported, but then I also ask, did you look? Because what I will present to you now is mostly uh, related to the gut and gut function. 
there are some other uh, problems we also have had, I won't mention them. Um, and who looks into the gut? It's just removed. And uh, so maybe there are problems there that we don't, uh, we are not aware of. Okay, they are well known, but I mean, the ones I mentioned, but need to be watched. So, uh, what we often see, and you may see also in chicken, that if you replace the concentrated ingredients with a, ingredients with lower concentration with more fiber, you will see a growth depression. These are results from, a, uh, from COD uh, experiment we did, and with increasing uh, level of uh, plant, uh, plant ingredients in, with, on the x-axis and, and the growth on the y-axis, the two different, uh, it's the protein efficiency and, uh, and the growth rate. Um, it goes down. And if you look at the feed conversion ratio, it goes up. More and more feed is needed per kilo production. And, but hey, look here, this is the feed conversion ratio. It's one, almost one. You get one kilo of fish out of one kilo of diet. I think we mentioned we were very happy and uh, proud of getting down to 1.8 for the chicken. Here is 1.2, maybe, 1. Um, it's cheating a little bit because the energy concentration is higher, but still it's very efficient. It's the most efficient production we have in, uh, in uh, Europe. It's the salmon production and cod. Uh, the cold water species need even less maintenance energy than the, the warm water species. Um, what we have noticed, which I want to mention, is that a negative effect on sterile metabolism. You may know you should eat fiber to get the cholesterol level down, and we see the same in the salmon. Uh, we did a time response study, starting to feed the fish uh, about 20% soybean meal, or diet with 20% soybean meal, and following the fish and what happened in the plasma uh, over 21 days. And you see immediately we get a, a decrease in the bile salt in plasma and the similar um, result with the cholesterol. And if we look at the content in the, uh, or the intestinal content, we see a similar uh, uh, reduction in the bile salt level. And what are the bile salts doing? Well, you probably know. Uh, most of the bile salts in, in fish is tarocholic acid, uh, 95%. And I, sh I shouldn't, uh, this is the, the list. Well, the bile salts are very important for the, for the lipid digestion. Um, and they enhance the uh, stability and activity of other or proteolytic uh, enzymes, regulate pancreatic enzyme and CCK secretion. Um, it's important in electrolyte and fluid absorption, in calcium absorption, regulate expression of genes involved in release of anti-inflammatory factors. Remember that. It's important for the release of anti-inflammatory uh, factors. Stim stimulate also secretion of antimicrobial factors. So if they are lacking, well, you get more inflammation and you can't control the bacteria. Uh, it regulates apoptosis and seems to be important in cancer protection. Or promotion, if we get a lot of secondary bile salts, they will promote cancer and more. Okay, so to an experiment or a series of experiments where we have used soybean and pea meal in salmon diet and we see reduced feed intake, reduced digestibility of protein and inflammation. And which you can see here, the uh, picture to the, to the left for you is the normal histology of the distal intestine in the fish. Whereas the one to the right is the histology of a soybean meal or pea meal fed fish. Pea meal at a much higher level than, than soybean meal. Um, and you can see this is very similar to what you see in uh, p people having uh, celiac disease. Um, and we see all signs of inflammation, increased cell pro proliferation and de cell death, uh, as activation of a cascade of immune related processes, and we see diarrhea, leaky gut, and a lot more. We all have worked in extensively on this. Oops, am I, I, I used my... Uh, uh, we have found now that it's caused by saponins, and, and uh, that the uh, um, 
uh, inflammation is possibly aggravated by other components of the beans. When did I start? Uh, it's a dose dependent, can you see this? From, from the left to the right, m increasing levels of soybean meal, 0, 10 to 35. Um, the normal uh, gut, uh, you see to the left there, a very thin lamina propria, and, well, maybe I can. Can I see? Yeah. What is typical for the norm normal is that very thin lamina propria. And, and at the, towards the lumen, uh, lots of absorptive vacuoles, which may contain lipid, but pro also protein for uh, presentation to the immune system. If you look at this with uh, 10%, the vacuoles are diminished number, and the lamina propria is higher, and we see uh, infiltration of immune cells. And with 35, the situation is quite severe. Uh, looking at the brush border membranes in a dose response uh, study, uh, this is mal maltase that I show here. With no uh, soybean meal, we have very high activity, uh, decreasing already at 10%, quite dramatically, and then further de decrease in the brush border enzyme activities. So we see um, an increased cell proliferation, and uh, it, we, the cells are immature. When we look at them on the, the intestinal folds, they are immature and have lost or never produced any enzymes. And the, this the picture is very much the same for all the other enzymes that we looked at at the same time. So nowadays we look only at maltase, the other follow very similar. <coughs> so T cells are involved. Um, here are again these normal folds and you can see the T, T cells are nicely aligned along the the lamina propria, here's an, a, a large picture. In the soybean fed fish, uh, I think we had 20%. Uh, it's a massive invasion of T cells and, uh, and the, the inflammation is, is obvious. And also we, oh sorry, yeah. We see a lot of inflammatory, uh, the interleukins, etc. Now to the next problem we have, uh, which we call the lipid mal malabsorption syndrome. Uh, we gave it the name, it uh, has been seen for some years, sporadic around the coast. Uh, but you, what you see is um, the, the intestines are, are, look swollen, they are quite whitish, and if you open the distal intestine you see a lot of lipids. And it's floating around, it's uh, released into the environment, and I don't know whether you can understand it, but this is the surface of the water packed with lipid. Not very nice, uh, environmentalists object uh, quite uh, strongly. Um, it's suggested to be related to deficiency of uh, digestive components in the intestine, such as uh, can be bile salts, cholesterol, taurine, phospholipids. And we now, together with the industry, think we have solved the problem, but I can tell it to you now. I hope we can publish it. But that's the bad thing about working with the industry, they won't tell when we find something. But I think we have solved the problem now. Uh, yeah, if you look at the uh, histology of the pyloric zika, where the lipid absorption uh, mostly takes place, this is a normal picture, um, where very little vacuoles in the proximal part of the intestine, we don't see traces of what the nutrients that are absorbed. But this is, you see, the same uh, area packed with lipid. And I think we have an, uh, also a, uh, picture from uh, 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 scanning uh, EM. This is the uh, fold of the intestine of a normal. You see the cells are, look quite o empty, but this is what it looks like uh, in the in the steatorial situation. With all these all these droplets are lipid uh, vacuoles. Okay, we have gastric bloat. This has been around for so long. Uh, if in an experiment, if we look, if we anesthetize the fish and look at this, we see floating uh, lipid on top of the surface. And when we open the fish, the, the, the stomach is filled with water and lipid. And when I punch this, it just floats everywhere. I've, in a four kilo fish, I've taken a half a liter of wa salt water with lipid. It's not nice. Uh, the fish seem to behave or to, they grow, uh, but uh, we don't really like it. Um, it seems to be, we haven't solved the problem uh, yet, but it's related to the feed composition. The technical quality of the feed, it may be too hard or too dry. 
And nowadays they dry the feet until 95, 96% dry matter, which may be hard to dissolve and maybe something goes wrong in the stomach. Uh, we have another problem with the undissolved pellets. Can you see that with a spot straight on the... Oh, anyway, pellets stuck in the pyloric sphincter. It's, uh, when we open the fish, we can find undissolved pellets, both uh, distal to the pyloric sphincter and of course in the stomach, and one pellet sitting in the sphincter. And it, it's so strongly contracted that it won't pass. Uh, also, again, technical quality. So there's a lot to do on that. Uh, ingredient composition also, uh, yeah, processing condition, feeding rate, and water temperature. Of course, when the fish goes at five degrees, things happen very slowly, and that's a different thing than at 15. Okay, we have seen stomach ulcer, also related to some ingredients. I think we fed them diets with lupins, and then this is a very uh, seldom uh, observation, but people don't, don't look but it's um, also ha ha hasn't really been uh, diagnosed before. Uh, so new things happen all the time. Maybe you have to do with pellet hardness. We have seen colic in cod. Can you see this at all? I can. But uh, complete stop and, and um, uh, blood uh, in, the, in the gut wall. We don't know that. We haven't, it was uh, occasionally uh, showing up uh, two or three years ago, but hasn't been seen lately. No explanation now. But we have spectacular <laughs> intestinal cancer. And that was in, uh, in uh, mature animals in the broodstock. Um, and inflammation, you know, we know that uh, inflammation of the gut is uh, predisposing for, for cancer. So the subchronic uh, 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 cancer or stimulation of the immune system that we can get with a little bit of soya, a little bit of peas, a little bit of whatever in the diet can give uh, this condition which develop when uh, the fish mature. Yeah. We have done some challenge trials for what does it really matter? The, if the gut, if the fish grows and the gut seems to handle this, Okay, what does it matter? We have done some tr um, challenge uh, trials with different um, viruses and bacteria. And this is the survival uh, or the uh, mortality rate of the challenge with uh, an uh, infectious pancreas necrosis virus, IPN. And this is uh, for uh, when we use the diet, the two t uh, pens uh, of fish. Uh, uh, this is with a diet based on mainly marine, uh, marine uh, ingredients. And we had the fish fed the plant diets. I'm sorry to say, we, we, we challenged the disease resistance, obviously, with the plant. But the good thing, we also had a commercial diet. Hmm, much less. These are signif highly significant differences. Um, so there are ways to stimulate the immune system, and the industry knows more than I. Uh, I know a little bit. Uh, and nucleotides, uh, uh, carbohydrates, uh, beta-glucans, um, and um, um, short-chain fatty acids are, are used to stimulate the immune system, and we see it works. And it's, that's, so the situation isn't as bad as it could have been with all the plant material in the diets. <coughs> Yeah, uh, this picture is not so nice for all uh, pathogens, but uh, anyway, there are ways that we can work to, to maybe overcome the, the challenges for the immune system. Okay, so the final, uh, this is the final uh, picture. We need to strengthen knowledge. As you realize, there is a lot of questions out there that we don't uh, have an answer for, and, and uh, things are changing and moving very fast, so the, we should have a, a, enough research money to to, to follow up. Um, we need to find the relationship between the in, in content or in the diet of indigestible carbohydrates, antinutrients, interaction with the microflora. We are just on the edge of starting out uh, the microflora. Uh, with the new tools, that's, uh, we have a, a great possibility. Uh, and interaction with environmental variations and um, water quality. And we, there are complicated relationships. Uh, the effects depend on the growth rate, physio physiological status, 
family, species, etc. And that was a, here is my group. Thank you for your attention.